Thank you, thank you. Oh. Uh, yeah, so welcome everyone. Um, as she said, my name is Ryan Campbell. I am a member of the Citizen Nation Potawatomi Tribe of Oklahoma, but for the last, oh here, let me take this off. <laughs> for the last 20 years, I've been working in the territory of the Hawaiian people and um, uh, working at the National Tropical Botanical Garden. And I'd also like to acknowledge the tribes of the Chesapeake Bay area on whose ancestral homelands we are standing today. Um, also in this project, Dustin Wolkis, Kevin Hoke, and Haley Walter were instrumental in the work I'm going to describe, and they really helped put this presentation together. So the state of Hawaii is a biodiversity hotspot. We have 1,367, roughly, native plant taxa. 90% uh, of those are endemic. Approximately 10% are now believed to be extinct in the wild. Uh, that's according to wood and all. And uh, we have less than 1% of the land mass of the United States, but more than 50% of the federally listed species. And up to the north of the island chain is Kauai, which I'm going to talk about now. On Kauai, we have 256 single island endemic vascular plants, all recently evaluated for the IUCN red list by our science and conservation team. It's a good time to, to uh, do that during COVID. So uh, they did all the species on Kauai. 95% um, are threatened with extinction and 5% are considered already extinct. And another visual for this is the IUCN red list scale. Uh, the left being either not evaluated or species of least concern and the right being endangered, critically endangered, extinct in the wild and or extinct. So you can see our all of our endemic vascular plants are grouped here on the right side of the scale, which really represents a crisis in biodiversity loss in Hawaii, on, specifically on Kauai. Um, federally listed, though, only 45% of our species are federally listed. So it's a lot more challenging to get them on that list. Um, So this is the process I'm involved with the most at, at the garden. Um, it's pretty common conservation process where plants are collected or seeds are collected in the wild, moved into either the seed bank or the nursery for ex situ collections. Some come out of the nursery and go into out plantings back out into protected areas in the mountains um, or coastal. And one thing I wanted to point out up here is, uh, oops, I didn't mean to press that one. This thing right here is our new uh, Mamba robotic drone arm collection tool that can uh, take cuttings of seed pods and just cuttings of plants um, up to a mile away from the operator. And we have really rough terrain on Kauai, so this is really going to be an instrumental tool as we continue to collect plants and plant material out in the wild. So at the seed bank and lab, we have 17, over 17 million seeds. That represents 5,000 unique collection events out in the wild. And um, a vast majority of those are endemic. We do have some like cultural canoe plants from Polynesia. We have some introduced seeds. We have some other seeds that we're using for research and other things. And we also have fern spores and some pollen for plants that their reproductive cycles aren't matching up quite right. So the uh, viability testing is really important when you have a seed bank. Um, we know that over time the viability goes down. And a paper by Chow and several other people have found that uh, several Hawaii species are sensitive to freeze damage. So they recommended that we start testing them, especially during years two to five to test for that. Uh, when we see a 30% loss in viability, it triggers the need to regenerate our seed collections. So people go out and collect more seeds. Um, in 2022, we sowed 1,200 petri dishes. This is like 
each a sample of one of those accessions that came due for testing. And volunteers mainly did 27,000 individual checks of trays. Uh, when they find germinating plants, those are labeled and put in a new tray and they're sent down to the nursery for growing. In other seed banks though, that's not always possible. And so in some places, their options are to incinerate or autoclave those germinants. And this isn't happening everywhere. I've already met a few people at this conference who are finding ways to save these plants. Um, but it's just not always possible. And that's because the main objective of the seed bank is efficient and cost-effective preservation over time. So growing plants takes resources, money. Um, it's quite a process. It takes a lot of time, too, and a lot of labor. So. Uh, this is just kind of a, an exploration of other possibilities that we could do with these uh, germinates. So we are lucky enough to have both a seed bank and a nursery at the uh, National Tropical Botanic Garden. So several years ago, we started sending these plants down and transplanting them. And you can see they're very, very small. They don't transplant well most of the time, um, but we have learned with some patience, some delicate handling, and uh, kind of creating more hospitable conditions for these, we're getting better and better at it. And you can see over here, these are some of our rarest of the rare plants that uh, we're getting to survive in our temperature controlled fern lab. So. This just kind of demonstrates that challenge. Um, both of these dishes were uh, two weeks from germination. So they'd been sitting in, the germ in that growth chamber for two weeks since they germinated. Some plants grow very quickly and they're robust when after two weeks. And some plants like those on the left are very thread-like and they're just, you know, not easy to get to survive. Some success stories though. Um, this, this plant is our Hawaii state flower, Hibiscus brackenridgii, subspecies brackenridgii. We collected from a population on Lanai in 1992 and uh, planted some in our garden and sent some for storage in the seed bank. Uh, the ones in the garden, without anybody really realizing it, they all died. And this was a species that or this was a sub a subpopulation of this species on Lanai that there were only four individuals left and they're gone. Um, so all of our living collections had died and nobody had really recognized that fact. So some of these came up for their 30 year viability check and we grew them up. We thought they were amazing. We got them back out into the gardens and then we realized what a special subpopulation this was. So um, it's kind of cool that sometimes just this process can drive conservation efforts. So now we have it on our radar to uh, pollinate these and collect seed from them. And this is my assistant Haley and our new cuckoo member, which is like AmeriCorps, uh, sitting next to one of the plants in the garden. And they're kind of bonsai-like. They also have these cool spots on the back side of the petal that we haven't seen on the other Brackenridgii, so it's kind of cool. This is another one, Kadwa cookiana, that only grows like on the sides of waterfalls on the Nepali coast. Uh, they're on really steep, rocky slopes and really hard to collect from, so we've been just maintaining a collection in the nursery for quite some time. We were able to collect about 300 seeds a few <coughs> years ago, and during the viability checks, we got five that germinated and two that survived, one of which is putting on seeds right now. So I hope to collect from this when I get back. These are the list of species where the seeds were over 30 years old that we had some survivorship in the nursery. And the ones in yellow are federally listed. So kind of a wide range. So we have now grown over 20,000 rare plants just from this process alone um, since 2020. And we're using those plants in restoration projects, in uh, regeneration, so more seed production for the seed bank, uh, education, 
displays in the garden. And for us in the nursery, we've been using them to research growing techniques, uh, which we have learned a lot. We have like a steady supply of these plants coming in now, just a few at a time, but um, it's been fun to be able to experiment with them and we are definitely learning how to grow them better. Um, and then future uses could be uh, research on phylogeny and just about anything else you can imagine. So every good presentation needs a box plot chart. <laughs> <laughs> this is mine. It's a survival of germinates by accession. And you can see some of them at the bottom here not surviving well at all. Um, but others did really well up at the 100% mark. And most are in a range though, and I really kind of attribute these wide ranges to our improving success over time. Um, you know, we're just getting better at, at handling them and being patient with them. This one here, uh, this is Bergamia insignis. And this is one where we've had several hundred germinates come down from the, the seed bank as part of a experiment by our conservation biologist, Shauna Walsh. Um, and over time, you know, at first we were getting maybe 10% to survive and now we're closer to 50%. So, and that's just by waiting a little bit longer, uh, letting them get a little stronger and then not placing them in the greenhouse right after the transplant. We just leave them on the table overnight in the shade and then the next day we put them out and that really helps. <laughs> So what do I hope can come out of all this? Um, well, you know, for people working in seed banks or restoration partners, I'm hoping that there can be some increased working together. Uh, this is a possible addition to the supply chain for native and rare plants. Um, so I kind of see the seed bank in the middle and possibilities of organizations that can grow out some of these plants could be native plant nurseries, indigenous restoration projects, working with tribes in your area, uh, the master gardeners in your area, universities or extension offices, conservation nonprofits, and K through 12 schools. Um, and of course, I gotta mention that when you're working with T and E plants, you'd have to follow the regulations on your permits, so. Um, And I just wanna mention that partnerships with community members can create possibilities. So some of those possibilities are inspiration of new conservation or restoration projects through tribes, schools, et cetera, positive impact on local conservation and restoration efforts, outplantings of more native and rare plant material back into the environment, advancements in horticultural knowledge on a wide variety of plant species, contributions to the wealth of scientific knowledge of plants and inspiration for people of all ages to get involved. Finally, it's nice pictures of everybody involved. And I just wanna call out uh, Margaret Clark there at the bottom left. She helped revive our seed bank at, at NTBG and really get it going again. And we lost her unfortunately last year, um, but she made a lot of contributions and then Ashley Trask, our past nursery manager, who wanted to come here and present on this topic several years ago, but wasn't able to find the time. And finally, our nursery cats, <laughs> who keep all these lovely plants alive. So. Anybody have any questions? Oh. Thank you. No, actually we test when we first turn an accession in and then every year through the fifth year and then at 10, 20, 30, I think is the protocol we're following. Any other questions? Um, a lot of it is the patients I mentioned a few times. <laughs> so. Um, you know, when we first started, we're trying to grab them with tweezers and things like that. Actually finding that trying to balance them on the tweezer, gently move the grains of dirt around, you know, the media. Um, 
I mean, it's just really taking more time and care with those plants. Um, one other improvement we did was um, the plants would sometimes desiccate while they waited those two weeks for transplant. Um, so we had the volunteers in the seed bank start adding a little bit extra water. It's kind of a fine balance though because the dishes can mold. So, you know, you kind of balance those needs out. Yeah. Right here, okay. Um, not at the moment. We have a mist house where if it's really hot out, then we'll go ahead and put them in the mist house so they'll get kind of misted every 30 minutes. Yeah, but uh, if it's not too hot, we actually don't do that because that can create mold issues. So, yeah. Did you have a question? Right now we're just using germination testing. We have such a wide variety of species. We don't know of any non-destructive methods to test all of those. I know there are several being evaluated right now, but they're more like species specific. So, mm -hmm. We just have very few populations left of most of our plants. Um, and very few plants left in those populations. <laughs> so sometimes they just don't nick right. They could be from different elevations. Uh, we have a lot of microclimates on the island, so they each have their own little niche. Often it's between, and um, sometimes though it is within a population too. And I don't know exactly why that's happening. It might be part of the reason they're endangered. <laughs> We're doing a couple different ones. We have a coastal mix and we have a montane mix. Um, so the coastal has some sand in it and uh, shell, stuff like that. Uh, the montane has more of a cocoa, cocoa coir, peat, perlite. Um, sometimes we use a little native soil. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do that. We have found that's really helping. So we kind of have a recipe book that we follow depending on the species. Yep. Okay. I don't think so. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Lisa Hill and I work at the National Laboratory for Genetic Resources Preservation in Fort Collins, Colorado. We are a USDA Ag Research Service Laboratory and I'm going to talk about evolving methods and information to increase the utility of gene bank seeds. Um, I know I look around this room and I know some of you have been to NLGRP. For others, of course, you're always invited, um, but we uh, store, depends on how you count. We have anywhere from 1.1 million to 400,000 um, samples in our lab. We, we do have 1.1 million bags of seed. We have 400,000 samples that are truly curated. And by curated, I mean 
um, we do an initial viability, there's very good passport data. There's, um, and there are standards in place and we monitor them over time. We have 16,000 taxa in that collection. And then I'm gonna, the rest of this presentation is about our SOS collection. So we have 21,486 accessions of those and those are part of that curated collection. And that comprises 4,355 taxes, so it is a very um, diverse collection. So how do the seeds reach NLGRP? <clears throat> the collectors go and they do the collections and they send them to the Bend Seed Extractory and then they are sent to the Western Region Plant Introductory Station in Pullman, Washington. And that is where they are brought into our National Plant Germplasm System. Um, all that information gets entered into um, our database, GRIN. There, there, sometimes seed weights are done, lots of imaging. Um, and so when the introductory station is, is done and that information is complete, they separate that sample, and half of that sample comes to us at NLGRP. Once they arrive here, we view our job as assessing the seed quality and verifying the quantity. So um, we look for those harvest dates and the received dates. During a germination test, we may do some species verification if we have any questions, um, certainly, um, we may look at the maturity, seed fill, if there's any mechanical or pest damage. We do 100 seed weight. We do a total weight and calculate the total seed number. Um, I think the biggest thing that we do, though, is we test their viability. Um, and we can do that with germination protocols, and you'll see um, a preponderance of TZ in the past. Um, in the early stages of this program, we did also a fair bit of seed cleaning, but I would say in the last mm, seven to 10 years, the samples come to us and they're beautiful. And we do, we do very, very little seed cleaning. So what does that look like when we're at NLGRP? The seeds come in and they are checked in, that's Allison, and they're checked in by our data management group. So they verify. Did everything they say is in the box and on the list? Did we really receive it? And verify that that information is in the database. And it comes out for germination tests. Um, when the seed is not actually on somebody's desk and you know being, not that it's being tested, but out being worked on or subsampled, our seeds are kept at five degrees and 25% relative humidity. We do an excellent job of monitoring the temperature and relative humidity in our rooms. We, that um, yellow little square does temperature relative humidity, and we have multiple in a room to just verify. The blue dots are, um, they're called blue maestros, and we will actually verify the relative humidity in the seed bag by putting those sensors in the seed, sealing it up, and just verifying that our seeds are dry enough um, before storage. Picture of a balance for us weighing. And then they make it to packaging where they are get assigned a location, given a barcode, and ready for uh, long-term storage. So this is sort of the history of the SOS collection at NLGRP. The Seeds of Success program was initiated in 2002. We received like 15 samples that first year. And then um, we got sort of sporadic and smaller shipments received through 2009 as that program was getting up and off the ground. Um, <clears throat> since then, we've typically gotten more than 1,000 accessions per year. And we had bumper crop years of 2015 and 2019 receiving seeds of more than 2,000 accessions those years. And then we, we look at our processing time. So processing time is important to us. I'm considering it the time from when NLGRP receives the seed until we get it into long-term minus 18 degree storage. 
Um, so you can see um, we have a, had a little bit of variation over time. Some of that change in time, processing time, is a little more de is a little less dependent on the volume of accessions that we received, but more um, dependent on some of the management goals that have taken place over the course of our collection. So the first half, you'll remember, um, we had Dave, for those who know, Dave Ellis, Stephanie Green was our next um, curator and in charge of SOS, and she retired in November. And then the last couple of years, Chris Walters has taken over. Oh, the unit was um, time, days, days. Thank you, number of days. So in the beginning, you know, we are aiming for less, it would be not, we're aiming for less than 200 days from receiving it to getting them into long-term storage. <laughs> so um, the graphs on the right, the year that we received the seed is, is on the bottom and the number for the top graph, it's number of viability tests we did that year. And in the bottom is the length of time that on average our tests took. So you'll see in the beginning that we had, um, we did no tests. And that's because we had no funding for this project. So 2010, we started being funded for this and we started doing germination assays. So um, in the beginning, most of our tests were only were 14 day tests and what had not germinated in 14 days, then we followed up with um, TZ vital staining. So you can see in those early years, um, more than 50% of our tests were relying pretty heavily on TZ. Um, that has changed in the last couple of years and you can see a difference in the proportion of germinated seed to TZ. And it's because um, we really are making it a priority to figure out how to germinate the seeds. Sending these seeds back out with no idea how to germinate it is um, really not as useful for the people requesting the seed. So we would really like that information. Um, we had kind of a dip in 2019 and 2020 for a number of tests done. You can see we had a huge number of retirements in 2019 of people who had been at the seed lab for way over 20 years. There was a you know, they were just of retirement age and it left a hole. Um, and then we had COVID and although we did get sent home for three months, I do have to put in a plug for our seed analysts who did a phenomenal job and came every day once they were told to come back and we just worried about spacing. And so I am not using that as an excuse. Um, the bottom graph correlates with that. That is the um, average length of time of duration of an individual test. So you can see for the first, up until about 2018, most of our tests took you know, less than 20 days. And as we have moved to you know, really figuring out how to get these to germinate, breaking that dormancy, um, the length of our tests has really ex expanded. So it is not unusual for us to do a 90-day pre-chill and move them around at different temperatures, just trying to crack that nut. So um, this is just a better example of this. This was Lomatium. They all behave the same way. So that was kind of, you know, how often does that happen? All three species of Lomatium behaving the same usually doesn't happen. So we had gone from TZ only, people had sort of maybe even given up a little bit and we just went to a straight TZ test. And um, recently we just found, leave them at five degrees. Do not take them out and put them warmer. Just leave them at five till they're done. So we don't even really call it a pre-chill. It's just it's germination conditions. Um, Acronanthrum does not work the same way. So that has sort of been one of our troubled species. And you can see with hymenoides, um, we went from TZ only, then we tried 100 day pre-chill, we've tried different temperatures. So um, adding gibberellic acid, that third bar, we're starting to get there. 
and now we mechanically dehulled it. So um, not mechanically, manually. So dehulling, 45 day pre-chill, German gibberellic acid, and we got all of them to germinate. All that were alive germinated. Um, with this species now we are working on, we have a great seed polisher. And so that's what we, that, that's its common name. Um, and so we are working at working out how long, how much pressure to use so that um, it's not quite so labor intensive to get all those holes off. So this is more like what we would expect to see, right? Each species actually behaves fairly differently. So the speciosum, you know, we, we were doing pretty well before um, fussing a little, but adding a pre-chill and gibberellic acid, we get a little more success. And um, dark, trying dark instead of light, for the one on the bottom right, you know, we improve germination. So this is still a work in progress. Um, as I think it probably is at all our seed banks. Whoops. Um, so you saw that graph earlier today um, where we have percent viability on the Y and aging time on the X. And notice I, on aging time, I do not have days or years or decades or centuries written on that because we just don't know and it depends on the species. So, <clears throat> but we all think about that. So which leads us to, well, how long does our SOS collection last at NLGRP at minus 18 degrees storage? So the bar on the red bar were all the species that we received in 2005 to 2007. And you remember, we were not doing germination tests then. So our initial test actually came several many years later, and the seed age on average was eight years old. So we got about 66% viability averaged over that entire collection with a large standard deviation of 25%. So for the presentation, I cherry picked some of our data because I wanted that third bar, which was how are they doing right now today? And so needed things that would germinate in the three weeks before making the PowerPoint. So, <laughs> I picked species that would germinate within three weeks. I picked species that came on the IDIQ list from BLM for their SOS project. I think that means special seeds. So I picked off that list. And when I looked at just those and went back in time and looked at their average germination at the eight year mark, we had 88% germination and 6% standard deviation. Now we're at year 19 and we are at 85% germination and 12% standard deviation. So then we go back and we look at that aging time graph. And you have this window, right, where you see no decline. And then you see a little bit of a cliff and then rapid, um, rapid aging after that. So we wonder, we look at this data and we say, where, where, where are we on that, right? So, um, we're going to look at it in a little more detail. So now I pull out just the, po the species in Poaceae. And we look at this and we're like, whoo, we brought seeds back to life. No, <laughs> that is potentially just, um, you know, variation in our samples, variation in, we did use similar testing methods, so unlikely that it was variation in testing conditions. Um, so you look at that and go, well, maybe that's our area of um, acceptable vi variation. And then we look at these two and go, well, <laughs> so are these two ones that are on the cliff? So then you look at your whole collection and you say, okay, well, what do we do next with this? And I think next what we do with this is we look at more um, species in the Andropodon and the Spartima, and we try to see, you know, is this real? Are we at the cliff? Or was this, you know, just this test? So this is um, some of the Asteraceae in the same, looking at the identical data that at the eight year mark and then the 12 year mark, or the 19 year mark. 
and the one circled in red is one we'll chase down and get a few more of those and a few more accessions of those and see if we're seeing the same trend. <clears throat> so where do we go for these germination protocols? So these are our seed analysts at NLGRP and these are our resident experts. This is where we go. Um, so that's Samantha and Amy, who's here, and an author on that, you know, one of the authors on this, Adrian, Tori, and Vincent's in the middle. And I have to share, Vincent is standing in front of our brag board. So we have a whiteboard, and as we generate new protocols and they work, we are just writing them on the whiteboard, which is not super useful to anyone else. So. <laughs> Some of you were at the CPC annual meeting last year, and there was a breakout workshop, and it was excellent. And it was all about where are we going to put all this data so that it is easily accessible to all of us, that it's a spot that everybody knows about, um, and it's time we have another follow-up from there and devise sort of an action plan from there. Just being in the set of talks earlier today, I learned of three new databases that I had never heard of and two new sets of huge data that need a home. So I, this is a common um, problem and it, it, this is a good group to work together to try to solve that. Um, what's the future for the SO? The future for SOS collection at NLGRP is um, decreasing the processing time. So we're going to continue to um, push that. Um, we're going to continue to improve those germination methods. Um, we are just on the cusp, right? We have a collection that's 22,000 samples, and we have done 40 monitor tests. So. Um, <laughs> You know that's where we're that's where we'll be starting um, for that. I think it's also really important that we communicate high priority, which we're going to say is low viability um, samples. Get that information back to BLM so they can decide: is this a sample that needs a recollection? You know, connect the dots, finish that loop, so the information is getting back to them. Um, another thing we're going to be doing is um, exploring the RNA stability of both incoming new accessions for SOS and comparing those to some of our older collections and seeing if um, that RNA stability might be a better marker for um, decline. And you're going to hear about that in the next talk. And I talked a lot faster today than yesterday. So I, I, I'm, I'm ready for questions. Oh, really? That's all? Sorry. I thought I had six minutes. Yes. So we... You know, you saw on some of those pictures, you'd see germinating car germinating seeds and behind that paper cards. So that is being recorded on that paper card with every change of temperature, every um, step. And then, unfortunately, not all that data gets transferred into our local database, which then feeds GRIN, the much bigger database. So information gets when we do a monitor test, we go back to those original cards. So we have it, but it's not out there. The cards themselves? No, we have like a library. It looks like a library. Yeah. Yes. I think so. Seed maturity is huge, um, and those would be notated on the card and into our viability program where that is. And at the population level for 
the SOS collection, we are not looking at any of that geospatial data during our part. I am I am not sure. I probably lean more towards taxonomic, except you don't know what about a really bad harvest year, right? You had no rain, you know, or and without doing a lot of homework, we would not have that information. Yes. Yes. Okay, so Mobot, you're wondering what they are. Missouri Botanic Garden has this they're putting everything up and what um maybe you could share living collections that were for our all of our living collections so that includes our species so okay right. thank you lisa thank you oh Hannah. hi Thanks. hi yeah Hannah's also from the USDA National Laboratory for Genetic Resources Preservation in Fort Collins. And she's going to be talking about the application of RNA assays to characterize seed health for wild plant species. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Hannah Tatro, and I work um, at the USDA ARS National Labor Laboratory for Genetic Resources and Preservation, the NLGRP in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, and I work in the research section with Chris Walters and Lisa Hill. And as Lisa pointed out, she did a nice introduction of the, the gene bank. So we have over, I like to say over 1 million accessions. <laughs> she broke it down differently as you, you heard. And on the right is a picture of our previous curator and Amy Gerza in our uh, gene bank in the vault. And then over on the left is Lisa with some of our uh, CPC, some of our native seeds. And this 1 million accessions is both crops, crop wild relatives, and native seeds. And I'm really happy to be able to work on this project with all these lovely ladies. So Chris Walters, Lisa Hill, Joyce Majinski, and Katie Heinemann wrote a grant with the I Institute for Museum and Library Services, uh, looking at the longevity of rare plant species. And so we've been able to do a lot of lab work um, looking at this, looking at longevity for some of these rare species. And Margaret Fleming um, spearheaded the, the assay that I'm going to be talking about, the RIN assay, when she was a postdoc with Chris Walters, and she continues to be involved in the, with the lab work. Um, and I want to acknowledge all of the CPC participating institutes for their, for all the botanists, um, for their botanical know-how and their collecting perseverance. As you can see some, from of these pictures I've lifted from the CPC website, you know, they go to some really great terrains. Um, and so that gives us a really nice diverse set of seeds from a lot of different habitats to work on. And then this work that we've been doing in the RIN, we're also going, in the CPC um, species, we're also going to be extending this out into the SOS program, as Lisa alluded to in her talk. Um, and then a special thanks to Amy Gerza, who leads our SOS uh, seed quality testing at the NLGRP. So one thing about gene banks, the seeds, when they arrive at the gene bank, they aren't stamped with an expiration date. So a, the job of a gene bank is to maintain seeds and make them available for use. And so for them to be usable, they need to be viable. And in order to do that, we have to do monitor tests, as um, Lisa went into great detail on, on looking at German, different uh, germination assays. And here are some of our CPC native species that we do our, our germination assays on. And one thing about seed deterioration is it's not an easy, predict predictable um, line. So we don't know when things will come in, if we can are able to predict. And as this graph is showing up throughout the, all of these talks, um, what it goes along in storage time, seeds go along. So on the y-axis is the present viability, and then on the x-axis is storage time. And as seeds go along in, the, in storage, 
you know, for a, a long amount of time, there's asymptotic change. We don't notice any changes. And then all of a sudden, we'll get this abrupt loss in viability. And this is what we call the, that threshold of longevity. So threshold, our longevity threshold. And so not only because it's a um, bi binomial data, so it's alive or dead, um, we also, so it's hard to make those predictions. You also need to have a lot of seeds involved for the power um, of a germination assay to determine the differences in your, your viability. So it's requiring you know, about 50 to 100 seeds in order to achieve that power, statistical power. And along with the, the shape of the curve being difficult to predict, you know, we also have seeds that are long-lived and that store really well in storage and that um, have that asymptotic part of the curve extending for quite a long time. We don't know. Or we can have short-lived seeds and then those crash and burn much earlier on. And if you're running monitor tests within every 10 to 20 years, you may miss on a short-lived species your viability that you want to try to maintain. So it's wanted. It's a timekeeping assay that's much easier to analyze than this binomial type of data. And from Walter's lab, we have been working on looking at this RNA integrity, um, which has demonstrated to follow um, seed health. So it deteriorates over time in storage with, these, with the seeds. And it's a, it's a continuous variable. So we have a nice linear re relationship. And we can use that as a predictor. So the, the two goals of this CPC IMLS project, the first one is looking at characterizing seed longevity for different CPC species. So as we, I've learned from a lot of people, and everybody here has stated so many times, there are um, very limited information on germination requirements for native species. And we are not sure how they perform in the seed banks. So this study has seeds that have been collected um, starting back in 1993. So we have um, about 30-year-old seed. And then the botanists and the collectors are going out into the field, and they've been collecting fresh seed from 2021 all the way. We're still continuing to get fresh seed from them in 2023. So then we can compare both the viability of stored samples and the fresh samples. So we can look at the germination of these. And then um, we also want are doing a subset of these species. I should mention there's about 100 different native species that are involved in this project. And with a small subset of those, we are doing a, um, an aging experiment to try to help predict with some of the longevity of different species. And then the second goal for this uh, grant was to apply the RNA integrity assays to see if that new technology can also be applied to these wild species native species. And as I mentioned, you know, the RIN follows a linear trajectory. It's very high, it's highly repeatable. It's not like with the germination assays where you have to do different protocols um, in order to get things to germinate. Uh, you use a fraction of the seed. So that's one of the largest powers be behind RIN is that you can use five to six biological replicates in order to get a nice average of your RIN. And then seed dormancy is not a factor. It does not affect how your RNA extraction goes, if a seed is dormant or not. And it's been shown that it correlates really well with longevity. So just as a, a refresher, so the central dogma of biology, we have our DNA molecule, which is very stable. That then gets transcribed into our RNA molecule. That's then translated into protein. Now, RNA degradation is an excellent candidate for aging. Because it's, it's str single-stranded, um, it's normally turned over and not repaired. But with in, it accumulates those RNA fragments. As the RNA fragments and degrades, it accumulates within those dry cells uh, because of the nice low RNA activity in these dry cells, um, dry seeds, sorry. And so we're actually able to take a dry seed, extract the RNA, and then look at how fragmented that RNA is. And how we do that is by using the Agilent Bioanalyzer. 
Um, so a couple things, we use uh, two different kits. You know, the Kyogen kit is our, our go-to method. It's the easiest, it's nicest quality. And then if we have seeds that have high starch, so for a crop, um, like rice is an example that got us started down this uh, new method of uh, RNA purification. So if you have seeds that have higher um, starches or polyphenols, the, you use a, another kit. Um, and then you take a small pico, pico size amount of your RNA sample and then you load it into those little tiny individual wells here. And then three of those have a gel. So you're passing your RNA through a gel. And then the output from these, from the um, bioanalyzer is one, you get a, a gel that shows you how degraded your samples are or an electropherogram like I'm showing here. So on the x-axis is time in seconds, and we can also plot that with nucleotides. The further out, the larger the um, size molecule that you have, molecule you have. And on the right, on the x-axis is the amount of fluorescence that's attached with your RNA. And with the bioanalyzer, you get a, a number, RIN, an RNA integrity number, one through 10, 10 being highly intact and high quality RNA. And then as you start going down, you can see you get sm much smaller fragments in your electropherogram and your RIN value starts to drop down. RIN is a proprietary number. <laughs> so if you wanna try to calculate that uh, without the bioanalyzer, um, that is not possible to do, so. And, um, as I, I mentioned, Margaret Fleming, when she was there in the lab, they did a lot of work in crops. So here is how the loss of RNA integrity precedes the loss of the viability in dry stored seeds for crops. So we have um, lettuce, onion, carrot, and pea with germination assays on the left, and then the RIN assays over on the right. And here we have a, a legacy collections that date back to the 1985 for all of these, and you can just see how nice it correlates with um, seed health. Now, applying this method from the crops over to the native species has produced their, its own set of caveats, um, such as seed size. So we have such a diverse collection in native seeds that um, we have ranges from you know half a milligram of a seed all the way to 14 milligrams um, per seed. Some other factors we need, that have needed to be considered in these native seeds are take, removing the seed coat, they interfere with the RNA extraction, seed quality, as well as seed composition. So just as an example for um, seed size for a successful RNA extraction, so for one um, biological replicate, you need about eight to 10 milligrams of tissue. With our crop species, such as lettuce, you know, we need, that's all cut off, I'm sorry, that's five seeds per biological replicate. So if you're doing a RIN assay at a given time, you need 25 seeds. Well, as for pea and soybean, you're using less than one seed in order to get a biological replicate. But then when we move over to our CPC wild species, we have some that it's requiring almost 130 to maybe 150 seeds per biological replicate. And so in some of these cases like this, um, the RIN, may not be as accessible for some of these much smaller seeds in practicality, right? But for the study, it's great because we're getting these averages and able to te tease out longevity for them. Another factor, and this is, comes from being a, a native species, is the seed quality. And we sometimes these seeds arrive with um, almost 50 to 75 percent empty seeds. So these are three of our problem childs in the lab where you have to sit under the microscope and make sure that you are actually getting a seed into your sample. And so when we're talking about using 20 to 40 seeds per replicate and you have 50 percent filling, you're already at, you know, 80. You need to be collecting at least 80 um, for a sample. So to address the first question of the, of our, the grant, um, we had to work out all of these um, little the caveats to the RNA extraction method. But now, out of the 100 species, we have about 80 species that we have um, RIN values for. 
uh, and it spans about 32 families in several different habitats. And if you saw Katie Heinemann's talk this morning, then you'll see that we're going to be doing a lot of more ecological uh, interpretations of the data. But so far, um, what we're seeing, because we have both paired and paired comparisons of germination and RIN, so now we're able to start looking at our species and seeing if we have long-lived or short-lived in, in storage. So here's a couple slides of um, the data that we're seeing. So here are some electropherograms for intact and degraded RNA. So astragalus al albums is on the left, and on the top are fresh seeds harvested um, in 2023 or 2021, I cannot remember, but uh, the RIN values are 8.7 with a 95% viability. Well, as stored at 26 years, we continue to have a high RIN of 8.8 .8 and 100% um, viability. And then over on the right, with this woody species, we have um, a fresh RIN of 7.8 and viability of 62%. While it's only stored in 17 years, 50% viability has, I mean, it's already decreased 50% of its original viability, and as well as showing a RIN of 3.7. And we can view it in the way that we've been uh, showing our graphs of um, germination. And so we can see that we have astragalus albums, which is a really nice example of a potentially uh, long-lived species. And then um, lysium, we have, uh, again, a, a potential short-lived species, similar to the one that I showed in the electropherogram. So in summary, to, in order to do effective gene making for native species, we need to understand the seed longevity and make these predictions. Um, and then with the modifications that we've had to make within the lab to perform a successful RNA extraction, you know, it, it's showing that we can transfer this technology from the cultivated to wild taxa and that it does look like a promising assay in order to measure seed health for these, for native species. Thank you. For have I found any correlations between that and what was the first part? I no, I, I haven't, but you know, I haven't looked um, much at this data set for the RIN data, and I, so. Uh, can you just show like how many genes that you did for each test? Uh -huh. Showed uh, the mating soybeans or something, and what was the three? And when do you want, do you want genes specifically? Yes, so actually, we put out a paper. Um, it's a power analysis paper. I was going to put some of that in here, but it was just, it ate up a lot of time. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the power of RIN is that you really do need, a, you need six replicates in order to tease out a small change in RIN. Um, when you, and then when we compared that to germination assays, it took hundreds to thousands to get that difference that you can detect in RIN. So it is the, that's the power. So you can use three as an average, because statistically you can get an average with three. And that's what's nice about RIN, it's a continuous variable, you get a standard error. Um, but the I was more. Yeah. And that's that's yeah. And that's the nice thing about Rin is that that RNA is in there, and it, it's as it's stored, it's degrading, and so you're catching that degradation and that fragmentation versus if that seed was viable or not. Because we've also done some RNA-seq to look at the transcripts in those dry seeds. And they're actually, not, from a, a live seed versus a, a dead seed, they're not different transcriptionally. So it does matter. For yeah. genes, for right. gene expression, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anna.
is Bailey Hollox. I'm the Seeds of Success Coordinator for the Department of Agriculture, Agriculture Research Service, National Plant Germplasm System. Um, today, my talk is on optimizing regeneration protocols for USDA, ARS, National Plant Germplasm System, Seeds of Success Collected, Astragalus Species Genetic Resources. The other partners on this study were Elizabeth Martin out of Lewis and Clark State College in Lewiston, Idaho, Barbara Hellyer, who is our horticultural crops curator and with the MPGS in Pullman, Washington, and Dr. Brian Irish, who's sitting in this room today, and he's our temperate forage legumes curator for the MPGS. So an outline of what I'll be talking about today. I will be talking about what the Western Regional Plant Introduction Station is, and thankfully we had Fort Collins go before us, so they kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, and our role in the SOS program, and what is diverted from the Bureau of Land Management seed collection efforts to, over to the MPGS side. So what our SOS collection holdings look like today, and the diverse taxa that they represent. Next, I'll go into the study on the astragalus species, results, and conclusion. Um, the National Plant Germplasm System is, is affiliated with the Agriculture Research Service. We have 20 gene banking sites across the nation. Our core mission um, in the MPGS is to safeguard and conserve the genetic resources of important food and horticultural crops. And this is done through our gene banking system. Um, each NPGS site you see on this map, um, the heat growing map, is responsible for managing the genetic resources of the crops located to that region. Uh, you'll see circled in red is Pullman, Washington. We're in responsible for managing the genetic resources of some of the more important temperate crops. Um, also in Pullman, um, as Fort Collins said before, NLGRP said before, uh, we're responsible for taking in a portion of the native seed germplasm that BLM collects and managing it in Pullman. Um, all right, next. Uh, the native seed germplasm in the MPGS is collect, uh, received from the Bureau of Land Management Seeds of Success led program as a part of their nationwide seed collection efforts. Um, a small portion of what the BLM collects, about 3,000 seed, is diverted to the National Plant Germplasm System. And we manage this germplasm in a variety of ways. Um, at the Warpus Station, we take all the accession or data, so the passport data, um, unique to each individual plant accession and upload it into our Green, Green Global Inventory Software Management. And Green Global stands for the Genetic Resources Information Network. Um, this is how we manage the gene, the gene bank germplasm. Next, we uh, split the seed up into half and send half to Fort Collins, Colorado. So I really don't need to talk about what they did since they did for me. <laughs> um, next, we offer the native germplasm out for distribution to active curatorial programs by MPGS scientists. And the true golden nugget of the native germplasm is it offers out crop wild relatives and wild utilized species for crop breeding efforts. Next, we are set up in our Warpus station to distribute the native germplasm. We're a small portion of seed, approximately 100 seed, are offered out to requesters through our Green Global for a variety of research purposes. And then lastly, um, <laughs> fundamental to the Agriculture Research Service and our mission is how we understand this native germplasm to help us maintain, regenerate, and conserve the long-term and develop native seed stock. So just a snapshot of what our MPGS uh, germplasm looks like today. As it was said before, hope we, we can some we'll test you at the end of this, and we have over 21,000 accessions <laughs> that we've received that has been diverted from the BLM to the MPGS system. This represents 147 plant families, with the top three being Asteraceae, Poaceae, and Fabiceae. So this leads us into why we do research on the native germplasm. With such a broad and diverse taxa, there's an increased need for basic germination protocols and pollination ecology. This information will allow producers, land managers, and other interested parties 
to make efforts on long-term conservation, restoration, and rehabilitation. Furthermore, in the MPGS, it helps fulfill our core mission to regenerate and increase seed to maintain our gene banks. This leads me into the Astragalus study. The study took place from 2020 to 2022, and there are three elements to this study. First was to determine effective germination protocols for five different Astragalus species. From what survived from that germination study, we took into established field trials in Prosser and Pullman, Washington. And then lastly, what survived from that initial planting, we then um, applied pollinator treatments. Of the five different astragalus species we used were Bisulcatus, Canadensis, Germundii, Lentigenosis, and Lanchocarpus. And you can see in the column titled Accession Number, there are two different ecotypes. All of these were collected in the western uh, phytoregions highlighted in red. Moving on to the germination study. We started with the germination study to best determine how species respond to cold stratification with focusing on how to break dormancy. We had a complete factorial designs with three levels of cold stratification at zero weeks, two weeks, and six weeks. We had two different temperature regiments in our germination chambers, the low being 15 to 25 degrees Celsius and a high being 20 to 30 degrees Celsius at a night-day cycle with a 16-hour night and an eight-hour day. For numbers, we had four reps of 25 seed per treatment combo, stratification and temperature, with a total of 600 seed. Before entering into the germination temperature, after the stratification, we nicked the seeds with a scalpel, soaked over, overnight to imbibe the seeds, and then pre-treated with captan fungicide. Moving on to the germination results. What we're looking at in our graphs here are the five different astragalus species, on the x-axis, we can see the two different ecotypes, and then on the y, the percent germination. In gray is the zero, to, zero stratification level, yellow is two weeks, and blue is six weeks. And you'll see two different textures within those bars. No textured is the low temperature chamber, and then the high temperature chamber is the texture. And so the results um, allude to cold stratification at two weeks or greater was either equal to uh, um, greater than or equal to the other stratification levels. So any longer than two weeks, we saw greater fungal growth in the seed germination. And then finally, we had a temperature interaction on the zero week stratification level with the lower temperature, <laughs> the lower temperature um, typically resulting in higher germination than the higher temperature. So what survived from this initial germination study, we took one ecotype and then applied it to our field study design in Pullman and Prosser, Washington. We had our five different astragalus species you can see at the top of this screen. Very beautiful. We applied three different pollinator treatments. We had Apis mellifera, honeybee, Megachili rotundata, alfalfa leaf cutter, and then open pollinated. We had this in 45 plots in a randomized complete block design as you can see in our field design below here. We had one pollinator cage per treatment plot for the um, pollinator treatments. Get, catch up with myself. So for pollinator details, we sourced Apis mellifera in nukes and supplied one box per plot. And actually for the alfalfa leaf cutters to the right, we raised and reared our own alfalfa leaf cutters. You can see our staff member Rihanna here um, assembling an alfalfa leaf cutter egg incubator box where we placed in our fancy incubator and then 21 days later out popped and hatched all the cute little leaf cutters. We supplied one nesting board per pollinator cage and then placed 15 to 20 bees bi-weekly um, per pollinator cage. Um, for the pollinator details, um, you will see an image to the left of our field design with the pollinator cages and the arrows are pointing to the open fields. And I have to move over here just to show you an observation of the um, honeybee. This is a bombus species in the open pollinated bisulcatus plot. So super fun to see those cute bees flying around. And so there we go. <laughs> 
So let's jump in um, to um, the background results from the field trial. I'll talk about what survived from that first planting and then move into um, the pollinator treatment, germination and seedling bigger, and then the resulting fertilization and successful embryo development within these species. This and more, I had to cut some stuff out, of course, to hit my time, but all of these are all of these elements are so critical for our understanding and managing these genetic resources to maintain our germplasm. So moving into pl plant survival, nothing survived in Prosser, Washington. It's extremely arid and dry there. <laughs> so that could, you know, be a factor. Um, also, we had an extreme heat dome in 2021 in the Northwest. So we saw the temperatures reach above the low hundreds. So pretty intense. So what we're seeing here um, on the X axis is our five different astragalus species. On the Y axis, the number of plants that survived. And so the plants that did the best within this plant survival from 2020, 2021, and 2022 were Biosulcatus and Candidensis. We saw an extreme effect of environment on the other three species, Germundii, Lentigenosis, and Lentocarpus. So we were able to move forward on the pollinator treatments with those two uh, specific species. <laughs> um, three minutes, okay, I better get going. <laughs> um, so what we're looking at here is the germination and seedling vigor results. We wanted to know if pollinator treatment had any effect on seedling vigor as a result of uh, fertilization. And so these seeds, I'll just start it off with, were cold stratified in our cold storage. We had 200 seeds per plot that we analyzed. Um, so right away, we can see on the right-hand side, uh, canadensis, we have our different pollinator treatments, and then uh, that got cut off. So that's percent um, successful uh, germination. And so canadensis overall uh, had a significant higher germination than bisulcatus. And then you'll see the pollinator treatments were pretty um, equal. Um, we didn't see any effect there. Moving on to seed quality. We asked the question, how does pollinator treatment influence seed quality as a result of successful pollination um, uh, from these pollinators? So for this, we analyzed 30 fruits per plot um, randomly selected and analyzed three different seed developments under a stereoscope. We analyzed fully developed, aborted, and unfertilized seed. And so the results from that, um, you can see on the x-axis, uh, astragalus bisulcatus and canadensis, and the total number of seed on the y-axis. Uh, the aborted is in yellow, uh, filled is in green, and blue is um, unfertilized. And so we can see right away that astragalus canadensis had the higher rate of seed, fully developed seed embryos, and that was higher for the honeybee treatment here in the center. And then lastly, moving on to seed yield by pollinator treatment. Um, we asked the question for this, um, did a pollinator treatment successfully yield higher seed um, for these two different astragalus species? So what we found from this analysis was that astragalus bisulcatus honeybee treatment had a higher yield, and then for canadensis open pollinated treatment also had a higher yield. So we didn't see an effect from this because we're working with a highly complex biological system. So we ran a post hoc analysis, which saw a medium size effect, which explained 25% of the data. So if we increased our replication size, potentially we would see a greater trend between these pollinator treatments, which is really interesting. And then so conclusion from this, um, we likely saw the species distribution of where these seeds were collected had a, a huge impact on whether these plants survived in the field in Pullman, Washington. And then just to sum up our results, germination was highest for the Astragalus canadensis and seed set of the fully developed seed was higher for the honeybee canadensis and then for entire seed yield, it was highest for honeybee bisulcatus and open pollinated canadensis. So the reason why we study um, the, these type, we conduct these types of studies is to understand um, how to properly 
properly propagate <laughs> native seed and manage our genetic resources for this native germplasm. Knowing the co-evolved relationship between pollinator and plant species is fundamental to achieving those goals and increasing our, and developing native seed stock. All of the information that we learned from this study will be added to the propagation website, RNGR, and will be available. So, um, and this is our, thank you so much, and this is our Warpus unit in Pullman, Washington. And I'm available for questions. from different ego regions. So that's seed BLM collects, and they took the data from that and selected from there. Oh, okay, sorry. Hey. I had to go back several times and just collect as they've matured. Mm -hmm. How did you um, pick the pollen to target pollen? Like yeah, um, so alfalfa leaf cutters used in um, alf pollinating alfalfa, and I'm Guessing that they chose the pollinators because they're legumes and typically used in a legume setting. So um, honeybee is used for a variety of pollinator, you know, almonds and other production efforts. So I'm guessing it's along those agronomic lines of what type of pollinator does best and will yield the most seed. Thank you.